afternoon and welcome to a, uh, a very special edition of uh, Medical Grand Rounds. It's uh, a pleasure to uh, introduce Gerald Dorn, who is the uh, Phil and uh, Seema Needleman Professor of Medicine and Associate Chair for Translational Research and Director of the Pharmacogenomic Center at Washington University in, uh, uh, in St. Louis. Um, I've known uh, Gerald for uh, a long time and wanted to tell you a little bit uh, about him. Uh, he, uh, he went to Lander College in uh, South Carolina and then went on to the uh, Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston where he did medical school, house staff uh, training and his cardiology fellowship and a very productive uh, research uh, uh, training experience with per Perry Alushka who's a famous uh, uh, pharmacologist. Uh, Gerald and I first uh, intersected at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio where uh, he was recruited as a junior faculty uh, member as uh, the um, uh, director of the VA cath lab and to start his own laboratory. And you may not remember this, but uh, in very short order, uh, after uh, he came and established a lab, uh, he asked me to look at a paper that uh, he wanted to publish uh, that uh, he and his uh, laboratory technician, we all start small, uh, had, uh, had done. And so I took a look at it. A little I understood, I understood the packaging uh, of it. Uh, but he said, where do you think I should send this? And I said to the uh, Journal of, uh, and I said, I, you know, I don't know, what do you think? And he said, to, well, I was thinking about the Journal of Clinical Investigation. So I said, let him down easy. I said, well, you know, that's a really heavily peer-reviewed journal. You'll get a good review uh, of it. And uh, yeah, why not? Uh, you know, roll the dice. So about two weeks later, he came back and he said, uh, uh, guess what? And uh, I said, what? He said, the paper was accepted without revision. So uh, it thus began an illustrious career, but I told him at that time that save you this moment, it may never occur again. You can, you can tell us whether I did that correct or not. But uh, after um, uh, joining the faculty there, I succeeded in luring uh, Journal with me to the University of Cincinnati, uh, where uh, I became director of uh, the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine and head of the Cardiovascular Center. And Gerald really uh, took off uh, uh, scientifically like a rocket as, again, associate, uh, or rather, uh, director of the VA catheterization lab, uh, a skilled interventionist at the time. I'm not sure he's doing it uh, presently, but, but at that time, he, he certainly was. And um, he, he rose through the ranks from assistant to full professor, uh, became the Stonehill uh, professor eventually, and uh, uh, succeeded me as division director at that institution. And about five years ago was uh, induced to go to Washington University where uh, he currently is. Um, he, uh, he has had a remarkable scientific career. And one of the things that's always impressed me is that he is driven by a question and then develops analytical techniques in order to answer the question. So whether it's receptor pharmacology, signal transduction, uh, cell biology, um, you know, molecular genetics, or now uh, genomics, He's always uh, focused on uh, the problem of basic mechanisms of cell growth and death with a particular uh, interest in, uh, in uh, heart failure. Um, his research has garnered him numerous awards, among them is the election to the American Society of Clinical Investigation as well as Association of Professors of Medicine. He has served or is serving on all the major editorial boards, including circulation, cert research, uh, the JCI and the Board of Editors of, uh, uh, of Science. His lab has been consistently funded by the uh, National uh, Institute of Health. And uh, he's had numerous important uh, leadership positions in the um, American Heart Association and the Heart Failure Society of uh, North America. And uh, I'm uh, very interested in the, uh, seeing uh, his message today about how genomics is altering our understanding of cardiomyopathy. So please give him uh, a warm welcome. Uh, 
thanks for that, uh, that, that very kind introduction. So I, I, I can't come to Rick's place without telling a Rick story. So it, it is actually no exaggeration to suggest that Rick Walsh is the single individual who has most influenced my professional career. He has recruited me twice, <laughs> once to San Antonio. Where, um, where through happenstance, really, I was given a great deal of free time and a laboratory and thirty whole thousand dollars to 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 start up the package. So it's Robert O'Rourke's standard startup package, um, and and where I met my wife. So this is that was a, a, a huge uh, a, a huge change for me. And then subsequently, he recruited me to uh, to Cincinnati, uh, where I managed to keep my wife and, and move her up there, and and uh, and. She she, he's told you a little bit about, about the rest of what happened there. Uh, one, one story that perhaps you don't remember, Rick, shortly after um, I had arrived in San Antonio and, and the basement laboratory that I had inherited at the VA had, had belonged previously to a guy named George Reptek who did a lot of work with an HPLC. And so I inherited his HPLC and it was a reverse phase HPLC and I needed to do anion exchange. And so I went to, to our, our chair, or to the chief of cardiology, and I said, could I have $800 to buy a, a, a column and make this $30,000 instrument worthwhile? It's like, no. It's like, I gave you what you got. That's it. And I told that story to Rick, and Rick's like, I'll buy you an HPLC column. And, and he did, and we made good use of it. And, it, and the, the soft under center of Rick Walsh was clear to me at that point. Um, and, and that actually was why it's like when he said, would you like to come with me to Cincinnati? I'm like, yeah, this is a guy I'd like to work for. So uh, it was at Cincinnati where my interest moved into my cardiobiology and it stayed that way and that was through my interaction with Rick and, and Brian and the other outstanding group of investigators there. So it's a special privilege for me to be here. Now I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about our research today. I'm going to try to give you an overview directed largely for the, the house staff and, and perhaps some of our clinical colleagues about my impression of what genomics is doing to our understanding of cardiac disease and um, and also uh, what it is, how it is that we're going to be using genomic information. Mm, yes. Okay. So, first, let me remind you that the Genome Project, as is the completion of the Genome Project, is ten years old this April. Uh, in April of 2003, the Genome Project was declared to be complete, meaning that 99.9% .9 of the human genome had, had been sequenced. So let's just look from where we came. So it was five years before I was born that Watson and Crick described the, the double helix of DNA. It was in the 70s that Sanger uh, and then Gilbert and Maxim learned how to sequence DNA so we could begin to understand the code. In 1990, the NIH and the Department of Energy proposed and initiated the Human Genome Project. And this was a very large project. And of course, the history is obvious. What it was to do was to decode the entire human genome. And 10 years later, a draft human genome was published. Uh, and that was finalized, as I mentioned, in 2003. Uh, so so it's, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about what's changed between human genomics back then and now, but some of the things that we began to learn once the human genome sequence was noted, we began to initially focus on common variants. Each of us has common variants. I'll discuss that in a, middle, in a minute. But there's a haplotype map, which permits you to look at common variants within an entire genome based just on maybe a thousand, I mean, sorry, a million genetic markers. So the HAP map was published in 2005. And then importantly, in 2012, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements was published. And that's going to become very important. And I'll try to mention that uh, in a little more detail later on. So what, what is encoded in your genome? Well, it's 3 billion base pairs, that's 6 billion nucleotides. You've probably got about 3 million single nucleotide variants. 
three million DNA variations that separate you from, if you will, a consensus sequence. Um, you probably, in addition, have about 300,000 insertion deletion mutants, where little pieces of your DNA have been removed or, or duplicated. And each of us is walking around carrying somewhere between 60 and 100 damaging mutations. That is, those mutations whose effect are measurable at the functional level of the encoded protein. Interestingly, and this is these are uh, current knowledge. This is pretty much what we learned from the sequence of the first individual genome published by Craig Venter, and of course, being Craig Venter, he published his own genome. Uh, and, and it's pretty much pretty much what we found in Craig is is what we see uh, for the rest of, uh, for the rest of us. The big question becomes, how do we use this information? So um, let me first tell you that the first human genome uh, took 13 years and cost a billion dollars. These days, and we do this all the time, it costs about $3,000 and it takes two days. And, and the reason for this is because the technology has completely changed. This is the way I used to sequence genes in my laboratory. Then we got one of these machines, which is a Sanger sequencer that uses capillaries. Everything is now done solid state. Everything is done high throughput. We have just finished sequencing 50 hypertrophic cardiomyopathy genomes. Uh, it, it takes much, much longer to analyze the data than it does to actually get the information. Again, the question becomes, what do you do with the data? So that is the issue that I would like to address in today's presentation. Um, what have we learned from now thousands of human genomes that have been completely sequenced and, and over 10,000 where we have the complete exome? Well, we know that there is a steady rate of non-synonymous mutation in the protein coding genes. And it's about 1 in uh, uh, 10 to the fifth per gene per generation. So it's, a, it's an atomic clock, if you will, of genetic mutation. This is apparently invariant. And it doesn't matter whether you are a platypus or a human. About 1% of novel non-synonymous mutations, that is, mutations that will change an amino acid, will cause a fitness loss. And so that means that they are damaging. That means that they will somehow impair the function of the protein and of the organism. But these tend to be lost over time because of evolutionary suppression. So if you are no longer as biologically fit, then you are less likely to transmit that particular mutation to your progeny, and et cetera, and et cetera. And so evolutionary suppression tends to weed off deleterious and disease-causing mutations. And it's the common variants, therefore, that have not been suppressed, that therefore have, do not have large disease effects. And this is a very important concept, because 10 years ago, we were very much focused as a field on common variants, on the single nucleotide polymorphisms, because that was going to be the key to unlocking our um, uh, common genetic basis for susceptibility disease or changing in its progression. So let me give you an example from our own work about what you can learn from common variants. I believe that the most uh, replicated and accepted genetic risk modifier for heart failure was discovered by Tom Coppola and myself using a microarray study of a case control study of heart failure. And, and what we did was we identified a polymorphism uh, in the heat shock protein B7 gene that seemed to correlate with increased risk for heart failure. Now, as it turns out, that gene, HSPB7, is located in a block that is genetically linked with a neighboring gene, this chloride channel gene, renal chloride gene. And by sequencing both of these genes, we determined that it was actually the chloride gene polymorphism that conferred the risk. Because this is a damaging polymorphism, it adjusts the function of this chloride channel. And if you carry one of these alleles, one of these common alleles, you have about a 27% increased risk of heart failure. And so if you're homozygous, you have about a 50% increased risk for heart failure. That is not a stunning revelation. But as common SNPs go, that's about what you see, about a 50% increase. We did this in three individual cohorts. Since then, two European groups have independently confirmed the same SNP is associated with dilated cardiomyopathy. And more recently, uh, another group has found that you can measure altered renal function conferred by the same polymorphism. So this is how the kidneys are talking to the heart in the context of heart failure, which makes a lot of sense to us because we know about that. We know that the renin angiotensin system is safe. It is, is important, and we know that we can we can target. 
So all studies were funded during the first Obama rollout. Let's spend two billion dollars to the NIH. Only one billion of which got got spent, and this is the result of one million of that. But we went back to the NIH, NIH and said so we'd like to do a ten-year prospective primary prevention trial looking at how it is we might be able to prevent people who have hypertension from developing heart failure. If we identify this risk allele and treat them with ACE inhibitors, they said no. Too expensive, too long, we have too small of effects, we really don't care. And, and that's because we kind of moved away from the notion of common polymorphisms as being major risk modifiers that matter at the individual level. So, so maybe all the work that started with Watson and Crick has led to a dead end. That, 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 that was our impression when, when the NIH said no. But what we have also learned is that rare variation in humans is enriched for deleterious or dysfunctional variants. And this is a very, very interesting thing. As a species, we have a vast preponderance of damaging mutations. And that's because, well, so before I get to the because, let me present the case. So here's the, the case study. So this is a rare DNA variant, and, and this is going to be the prototype for, for my talk. So there's a 58-year-old white male who presented in 2004 for evaluation of an episode of chest pain and near syncope that had happened at an outlying hospital, in fact, in New Orleans. He was presenting to Methodist Hospital in Houston. There was a CK, total CK at the remote evaluation that was elevated. He had a history of smoking, hypertension treated with verapamil, BPH, and C-spine abnormalities. Is six feet plus tall, a little overweight. His blood pressure was kind of okay, but maybe mildly elevated, heart rate is 78. He had a positive S4 and a systolic ejection murmur. His echo showed concentric LVH. These are his posterior and septal wall dimensions. Normal wall motion, a global ejection fraction uh, between 65 and 69. And the notation was that relaxation was impaired, but filling pressures were normal. His EKG showed sinus rhythm at 63. There were diffuse repolarization abnormalities, and that's shown for you here. You can see in the anterior lateral leads the T waves are inverted. Relatively could be normal variants consistent with hypertrophy or hypertension. So because of its history of atypical chest pain near syncope, the systolic ejection murmur, LVH by echo, EKG abnormalities, he was classified as possible hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Perhaps the other reason for this is he was being evaluated by A.J. Marion, who's very interested in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So he's interested into a study court at Baylor and Methodist Hospital and underwent genotyping for 20 of the usual suspect hypertrophic cardiomyopathy genes. Uh, and all of this genotyping was negative. Subsequently, though, as part of the studies that we were doing, he underwent extensive gene resequencing and bioinformatic analysis, and he was unique in that he had a, a mutation in the in a mitochondrial gene, mitofusin 2, substituting R for Q at amino acid 400. This mutation, when we first discovered it, was not present in the database. Since then, it has been described only once. So it is rare. It's only seen once in tens of thousands of sequences, and uh, twice if you include ours. And it is potentially damaging at least by computational bioinformatics analysis. So, so what is the meaning of rare and damaging mutations? First of all, how prevalent are they? So I told you before we are unique as a species in having a lot of disease-causing mutations. And, and it's because there's been a population explosion in the last 5,000 years. So let me show you. This is a, a, a prediction algorithm of how many um, damaging mutations you should have, this is the predicted, as a function of how rare you are, which is determined by uh, how many individuals you have to sequence in order to find them. So this is the prediction. And then this is what we find in actual. This is observed. So this is uh, um, observed over expected for nonsense mutations, the worst mutations you can have. And, and this is over 10 times more, um, I'm sorry, over 40 times more than predicted. Probably damaging, possibly damaging. All of these are likely disease causing or disease modifying. Then when you get down to the benign and synonymous, there really isn't that much of a disparity. And so the reason for this discrepancy is because we have experienced explosive population growth over the last 5,000 years. 
So this is now on a logarithmic scale the human population growth on the entire planet beginning about 10,000 years ago. And there were roughly 5 million, uh, I'm sorry, but that would be, yeah, I think that's 5 million um, individuals up until about 5,000 years ago. And then we begin to get this logarithmic expansion in the human population up until only about 1,000 years ago. And the reason for this is because we developed agriculture. And with agriculture, you could develop cities and, and whatnot. So this is a tremendous amount of population growth. And then with the, with the um, Industrial Revolution, you can see that we have completely gone off scale. Uh, uh, during my lifetime, we've gone from uh, the 3 billion people to 6 billion people. This is insufficient time for purifying selection. There is not enough time to weed out the mutations that we are accumulating per gene per generation. Lots of, lots of generations. Therefore, when you look at the genome, 73% of all protein coding variants and 86% of all damaging polymorphisms are only 5,000 years old. That means that they've occurred within the last 200 to 400 generations. So we need to be looking at rare and damaging variants, not the common stuff. The common stuff is not so important. Deleterious mutations in disease genes are more recent than mutations in non-disease genes. We know this to be true. There are greater than predicted numbers of Mendelian disease traits, that is, diseases that are largely caused through the effects of one gene mutation. There's a greater opportunity for personal or private gene-gene interactions. Your unique genome and the fact that you're carrying 100 damaging genes suggests that at your individual level, we need to explore the gene-gene interactions that may confer disease. And because of the out-of-Africa expansion, all of these issues are more common in European-American versus African-American populations. I say European-American because these studies were done in American cohorts, but it should be uh, relevant also to the European population. The takeaway message is, if you do the math, on the planet, every gene has dysfunctional variants, and most of those mutations are going to be rare or private. So that's where we need to be studying. So how do you assign causality to a rare or private mutation? You can't do a case control study, or in the N equals 1, or 2, or 4. And so, so let's take a, a, a lesson from John and Cricket Seidman, who described the genetic basis, or one of the original, described the original genetic basis for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in this cell paper from 1990. And what they did was they very carefully accumulated phenotypic information over a series of generations. And uh, as is shown in this uh, hand, it is kind of quaint now, this hand-drawn pedigree, which is their figure uh, in this paper. And so it, in this type of notation, uh, uh, squares are men, uh, circles are women. If you have the phenotype, it's filled in, it's solid. If you have died, you are struck through. And then the genotypic information is formed by the little numerals in, uh, underneath. Now, in 1990, sequencing was very, very difficult. And so these studies were done using restriction fragment link polymorphism, so an RFLP, where you can find that uh, if you amplify the fragment and then digest it with a restriction enzyme, it cuts differently depending upon whether or not you have the DNA mutation. And so wherever there's a two, there's a, a black filled-in square. And so that is linkage between the genotype and the phenotype. So, so great. That's the way to do this. If you have a heritable gene, what we should do is familial analysis. So let's see how that applies to the case study. Well, this is, here's the sequencing, so we know we can identify this. And here's the guy, the proband, if you will. And we have no genotypic and no phenotypic information on anybody else in the family because they don't want to play. And this is very, very common. They, they actually really don't want to know. It's like, we would prefer not to know, so free echoes, no. We don't want to know if there's something wrong with our heart. And by the way, we don't want to know if there's anything wrong with our genome. And that's very, very common. So here, we're not going to get any additional genetic data, Lord knows we have tried. And we're not going to get any additional cardiac studies unless some of these individuals end up coming to the hospital for other reasons and they get studied. So we cannot rely on linkage analysis. Maybe we can just examine the function of this gene and determine whether or not it's important to the heart. And we're pretty facile at doing this. 
Uh, and in fact, in my laboratory, we've taken this particular gene, the minifusin 2 gene, and we have either suppressed its expression in the heart of fruit flies, or we have genetically deleted it in the hearts of mice. And we have now a very, I would say, thorough understanding of the role of this gene on heart function. And, uh, and it's, it's pretty good stuff. Uh, for a couple of years worth of work, a couple of papers in science. And so when you go to the, to the clinicians and you say, look, this is probably an important gene, they say, your argument has no relevance to us. Knocking out a gene in a mouse or a fly is not the same as demonstrating that a human mutation causes a human disease. And you know what? They're right. And, and aside from that, um, you know, we, we can't knock out every gene in a mouse. Well, can we model the disease in an organism? Can we take another book from Cricket and John, uh, another page from Cricket and John's book, and say, let's introduce the human mutation, either through transgenesis or, or knock-in, into the mouse, and see if we get the same disease. And so here's a dilated cardiomyopathy gene and, and that was found in a mutation in phospholipid and, and And what, what, this looks like it's a really good uh, pedigree, but actually they don't have genetic information on very many people. None up here, none up here. There's a little bit of genetic information there. So this was the genetic information was not sufficient to give you a nice, good, strong log score. So they made a trans gene and they overexpressed the human mutation in the human phospholipid gene in the mouse heart and it reproduced dilated cardiomyopathy, just as was seen in the original family. So that's pretty suggestive. That's pretty good. Um, we can do that uh, in my laboratory. So let me show you what happens when you introduce the human mutation, R400Q, into uh, a heart, in this case, the heart of a fruit fly. And really, I'm only showing you fruit fly data because it's just kind of cool that you can do cardiac physiology in gnats. Um, but this is a fruit fly in sagittal section. So here's its head, here's its thorax, here's its abdomen. The, the heart of a fruit fly is located back here. It's a long linear tube. And, and let me see if I can. And, and I have these great movies that show blah, 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 blah. But they don't work now because we couldn't get my Mac to work. So the inbound version of those studies looks a lot like this. And so here you can see you know, systole diastole, systole diastole. This is about 600 beats a minute. And here's the normal fruit fly. And here's the abnormal dilated cardiomyopathy fruit fly. And, and so we introduce the human mutation in the human protein in the fruit fly heart. Then you get cardiomyopathy. And we can do really, really cool stuff with fruit flies like stuff that uh, uh, there's not gonna, we can do stress tests and, and whatnot. And the cardiomyopathy flies fail their stress tests. I'll just describe the stress test too. It's, it's pretty, if you are born with leans, you hate to be on the ground. And so if you take flies or birds or whatnot and you throw them on the ground, they will try to get high. Now, laboratory flies are couch potatoes, so they want to actually fly. But they will run over to the nearest wall and climb up it. And because this behavior, which is called negative geotaxis, seemed to me to be a reasonable stress test for cardiorespiratory fitness. Just like if you have a suppressed ejection fraction in the clinic, we would put you on the treadmill test and run you and see how long you can go. And when you do this, you dump all the flies down, and most of the flies will, will climb very, very rapidly up the walls. And the heart failure flies don't. They climb up, and they fall off, and it's very, very sad. And I have really great sound effects, and that's the best I can do. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Okay, so it's not going to do it. So we built it in the mouse as well. And this is just to show you, if you overexpress the mutant in the mouse, you get hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, just like we saw in the proband. These animals will live for a while, and then they start to die. The fractional shortening is actually still normal, although it's significantly depressed. The LV mass is very, very much increased. And here's heart weight to body weight. And this is that's hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that's echo of the mouse. So we have recapitulated a disease in the mouse. But a mouse and a fly is not a man. And anyway, I've just told you that these rare and private damaging mutations are incredibly common. We are all probably carrying some of them. And we cannot make a fly model for every potentially disease-causing mutation. Certainly can't do it with mice. What we need is to model the disease in the dish. We need to understand the context of your genome, what your mutations are doing. And there is a way to do that. 
And I refer you to the work of my friend Joe Wu, who's at Stanford, who has kind of pioneered this disease in the dish um, procedure. And so what he does is he takes a, a human patient of interest, and he takes a skin biopsy or, or a blood sample and, and gets some T cells. And then from the skin biopsy, he grows fibroblasts. And then you can reprogram the fibroblasts to de-differentiate into iPS cells, pluripotent stem cells. And these stem cells have the ability to then be reprogrammed into neurons or abatocytes or cardiac muscle, as it turns out. And if you do that, then you have a reservoir of cells that you, you get your iPS cells from your patient, patient-specific iPS cells, and you can differentiate them into cardiac muscle, little beating foci of cardiac tissue in a dish, and then you can do studies on them. You can examine their calcium cycling, their contraction. You can examine, in, in, the, in case you're interested in channel function, what their action potentials are. Sometimes you may wish to do this in the context of, of, of different individual patients with their genetic mutations. Like if you have one gene that has lots of different mutations, you want to see if all of those different mutations have the same cellular phenotype. Perhaps you would also like to see whether, one, whether some of these mutations have the same phenotype in the same genome. And so in that case, you would gene edit these cells, but you just take some kind of standard iPS cells, and then using CRISPR or Talon technology, you can edit the genome, inserting whatever nucleotide variation you want. In any case, you end up with an, a personal disease in addition. I, I'm firmly convinced that this is the way we're going to be evaluating a lot of these diseases in the future. It's relatively quickly. You can get the answer in about six months. We're beginning to do this now. And so I think this is how it is that we're going to be approaching a lot of these mutations that are very rare or private and need to be evaluated in protein coding genes. So that's great. but. Protein coding genes are less than 2% of the genome. And you know, in the 70s, it was popular to call the, the non-coding part of the genome, again, 98 plus percent of your genome has junk DNA. But the ENCODE project has shown us that it is not junk DNA, that all of that stuff is, is uh, probably what distinguishes us from lower model organisms. So this is just a graph that I borrowed that shows the non-protein coding sequences as a percent of the genome from bacteria on up various organisms to get to human, assuming that we believe that humans are at the apex of this. Um, and, and so you're almost at 100% of the genome in humans, and you're at less than 10% of the genome for, for bacteria, 2% of the genome in some bacteria. So maybe it is not the protein coding part of the genome that confers upon us the advantages. Maybe what makes us more sophisticated is the fact that we have a complex regulatory network that is encoded within the other 98% of the genome. And so that's what the ENCODE project, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, uh, found. It's 80% it's by ENCODE, and this is our current knowledge base, so only one year old data. 80% of the human genome serves some purpose. It's not junk DNA. It's generally regulatory. Um, and, and, and this adds, again, another layer of complexity on kind of uh, conventional transcriptional regulation by protein factors. So I want to talk to you about two of the kind of non-coding parts of our genome, two non-coding RNAs. We know that there are messenger RNAs that encode proteins. There are ribosomal RNAs that are these structures on which proteins are translated, and they're transfer RNAs. We, we know that for a long time. There are many other forms of non-coding RNAs, and I'm going to talk about two of them. One is called microRNAs, which are very short uh, and, and uh, do post-translational modification. I'm sorry, do post-transcriptional modification of protein synthesis. And the other long non-coding RNAs. We, we know a lot more about microRNAs, so so let me talk about them first. So this is how I think the, the much of the world views the function of microRNAs. So you start with a gene, you transcribe it into a messenger RNA, the mRNA is translated into a protein, and then the protein has a biological effect. And this is, a, this is kind of a, 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 a nice linear paradigm. And under this paradigm, microRNAs operate right here. They recognize and bind to specific 
in RNAs because RNA RNA duplexes are very strong and very specific. So they bind to mRNAs and either destabilize them, meaning they promote their degradation, or they suppress translation. Either way, the mRNA does not make protein. And when my daughter was a high school student spending a, 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 a summer in my laboratory, she was working on a microRNA project. And, uh, and when I asked her what she did, she came up with the best function that, definition of microRNAs that I've ever seen, and so I continue to use it. MicroRNAs make mRNAs not make protein. So this, this is the function of microRNAs. Now, that, that's very attractive. Uh, and, and we like things that are linear and deterministic and proportional and predictable. It's like a light switch. It's on or it's off. And that's the way that I think many people even today still think that microRNAs work. But, um, but Francis Crick warns that while Occam's razor is a useful tool in the physical sciences, it is a very dangerous implement in biology. It is very rash to use simplicity and elegance as a guide for biological research. And I believe true words have never been spoken. We're not that simple. We are complex. And so I'll just, I'm going to summarize uh, six or seven uh, papers that we've published over the last couple of years, which have added on to this paradigm and actually shown us that microRNAs, although they have very small effects on maybe multiple dozens of mRNA targets, they have vast effects organism-wide. And that's because some of these proteins that are suppressed are kinases and phosphatases that then are, 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 are impacted upon the phosphoprotein targets of these, and then that might have an effect. Some of these proteins are transcription factors. Some of these transcription factors are phosphorylated by these kinases that are regulated, and that feeds back on gene regulation. And by the way, some of these genes that are regulated encode microRNAs, and so you get a feed-forward cycle of microRNA-mediated microRNA regulation that has broad systemic effects. So this is very important because it's been known for a long time that a microRNA will suppress and a, a particular mRNA target maybe 50%. That's not, that's not what we're used to. Um, but one, microRNAs don't suppress just one target. They suppress many different targets. And they do this in a variable way. So some are suppressed to a great extent. Some are suppressed not so much. And that's why I've now supplanted the light switch with a rheostat. This is reminiscent. The effects of microRNAs are reminiscent of, of weather prediction. I, I think you all are aware with the hurricane prediction maps, you can know exactly where the hurricane is going to be today. And then the next day, there's this little cone of uncertainty. And then five, five days from whence, it could be anywhere on the North American continent. That's weather prediction, and that's the butterfly effect. And, and what it says is even though you've got a mathematical model, very small differences at the beginning of a multiply iterative process can result in very large differences at the end result. That's what microRNAs do. They cause little differences at the beginning of these uh, cycles upon cycles of proteins and phosphoproteins and transcription factors and gene regulation. So little molecules with large systemic effects. Not only that, there are microRNA mutations. And we have identified one of these in microRNA-499, which was uh, defined in a couple of patients in heart failure. This is another rare and potentially damaging mutation. And, and interestingly, here's a normal wild-type microRNA and its structural complement with a binding site. Many of the binding sites are shown here in a target gene, SOX7. It's what happens when you insert a mutation. So the functional defects caused by this mutation are caused by these bizarre structures that occur in the RNA, microRNA duplexes. So this is uh, not only a, a, a method for uh, regulation in a very, very broad way of uh, systemic effects, but it is subject to mutation either in the microRNAs themselves or in the microRNA binding sites. Now, the reason I wanted to mention microRNAs is because clinical trials are underway right now with microRNA antagonists in a variety of diseases, especially hepatitis C. It's working fabulously in the liver, but it's going to be coming in the heart. And, and microRNAs mimic, mimics are an especially antimeres, antagonists, are going to be used within a very short period of time, let's say four or five years, as drugs for, um, for many diseases. 
And let me talk a little bit about the difference uh, between the therapeutic response when you're uh, targeting a microRNA versus when you're targeting a protein. So this is our standard approach to therapy. It's, it's a drug that targets a gene product, not a gene. And what we like to do is we have to be very specific, right? When we have our drugs, we want beta receptors to be specific for beta, not alpha. We want them maybe to be specific for beta 1, not beta 2. And so what, what we like is to be very specific for a target protein and then to have a very large effect on the target protein. In this case, I've, I've shown you suppression because the arrow gets small. MicroRNAs don't work that way. MicroRNAs don't target just one thing. They target uh, dozens of different mRNAs, generally all within the kind of the same functional pathway. Maybe it's cell cycling or program cell growth or motility. And they have these intermediate effects. If it, again, if you see a 50% inhibition, then you've done a good job. So here's what happens in conventional therapeutic type targeting of a biological pathway. Here's the pathway. Here's a stimulus and a lot of intermediate events that get you to your response. This could be, you know, agonist, beta receptor, G protein, PK this, blah, 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 and then contractility. Um, if you target one component of this with like a beta blocker, then you'll be very successful at inhibiting that, and at least for a period of time, your terminal response will be proportional to that inhibition. But biology is smarter than that, and we get what we call tachyphylaxis. Uh, pharmacologically, it's tachyphylaxis. And that is that the response goes away over time because the biology of the pathway will invoke compensatory mechanisms. You know, the upregulation of some other receptor or uh, invoking, uh, I'm sorry, uh, invoking a different or parallel pathway. So let's see what happens when you use microRNAs. MicroRNAs don't target just one thing. They target multiple effectors within a given pathway. They target each of them incompletely, so you don't have this tight constriction. And because you are targeting multiple aspects within the same pathway, it is relatively resistant to compensatory mechanisms. And so when you give an antimere, in, in experimental models that have now gone from rodents into primates, what you see is very broad, very sustained effects. A single dose that can have effects for four or five weeks. So microRNAs affect functional pathways at multiple different steps. Therapeutic targeting, either mimicry or especially antagonism, can obviate normal compensatory mechanisms and avoids tachyphylaxis. But I want to finish up the talk by also discussing this other form of non-coding RNA, which is called the long non-coding RNAs. And, and I bring this up because we know almost nothing about this family of non-coding RNAs. We know they're big, because that's why they're called long non-coding RNAs. These microRNAs are about 20 nucleotides in length. Long non-coding RNAs are 200 nucleotides or greater. So, you know, we can sequence them and we can identify them. Um, we're only now beginning to learn, one, how prevalent they are. Very, very prevalent. There are perhaps 16,000 long non-coding RNAs uh, encoded by the human genome. Um, and, and, and they exist in a variety of places. Some of these are intragenic, that is, they are encoded within the introns of protein coding genes. Some of them are genes in, in of themselves. They're intergenic, they're between protein coding genes. And some of them are actually on the opposite strand of protein coding genes, and they exist as natural antisense transcripts. They have their own promoter, but the RNA is antisense to this, and that means that it can tether itself to that gene and then prevent its transcription uh, and, and it becomes a regulatory molecule. And I, I just put this in, I don't know if any of you watched Star Trek uh, when you were young or the next generation or whatever, but in Star Trek they were always talking about these superior species that instead of having a double helix, they had a triple helix. And it's like Beverly Crusher was always finding the triple helix of the DNA. Well, and, and actually Watson and Crick originally described a triple helical structure for DNA that, that they discarded. Um, this is the triple helix. Now, some of these long non-coding DNAs actually insert themselves into the double helix as a triple helix and modulate DNA formation. This is my version of the, of the functional uh, role for, for long non-coding DNA, RNAs as we understand it. 
So these are these, because they're long, they have structure. And structure becomes very important. Just like a ribosome is a structural unit, not so much a catalytic unit. A transfer RNA is a structural unit. Long non coding or link RNAs are structural units. They are regulated by transcription because they are gene products. They are regulated by splicing, just like mRNA. So one gene can give you various different forms of long run cutting RNAs. And importantly, they are regulated by the environment. So a quick story from the world of botany. There's a long non there are two long non coding RNAs. One calls cool air, and the other one is called cold air. And these are the biological messages that tell flowers not to bloom when it's too cold. All of the machinery is there, but when it's too cold, these long non-coding RNAs are, are expressed. And they are, I'm sorry, they are always expressed, but they're modified in such a way that they prevent the implementation of the blooming mechanism until the, until the weather warms up and then they go away. So what do long non-coding RNAs do? Well, importantly, there are scaffolds for protein-protein interaction <laughs> That's the, see, on the Macintosh, that never would have happened. <laughs> so in any case, so, so importantly, like ribosomes, there are the, these, the nucleic acid structures for proteins. And they attract these large protein complexes. And because they are nucleic acids and single-stranded nucleic acids, they can then direct these protein complexes to specific areas of the genome. So they can direct proteins or RNA or DNA, because they can bind all of these, to sequences that are, that are also in mRNAs or DNAs. And finally, although this is a very minor role, they can be decoys. So they can be sponges. So if you need a link RNA um, that, that has, for example, a lot of microRNA binding sites, then it can be a sponge for the microRNA, preventing, preventing the microRNA from binding its normal mRNA targets. So I like to consider link RNAs as, as basically being UPS. They are, they are you, you, you invoke them or you call them in and you say, I've got some, some packages, these proteins, that I want to take to a particular address in the genome that is the RNA or DNA sequences. These are also very specific effects. Unlike microRNAs, which one microRNA can recognize many different mRNAs because it's a small sequence, weak RNAs generally have like one target. And um, so we, we began to ask, really, just like, because hardly anything is known about link RNAs, you know, what is the role for link RNAs in cardiac biology? And the first question we asked was, and this is um, RNA sequencing, is are they expressed in a tissue specific manner? And so this is just a principal components analysis. The red is the heart, this is liver, and this is skin. And you can see that the link RNAs exist in, in different uh, universes in the PCA. And also that in the individual link RNA profiles, I think this is 25 hearts and, and eight livers and six skin samples uh, from individual mice. You can see there's really very different uh, expression patterns. And if you standardize these, then you can see there are cardiac-specific link RNAs, about 350 of them. There are some uh, liver uh, skin-specific link RNAs and also some liver-specific link RNAs. Now, when something is tissue-specific, it suggests that it might have a role in development. Things that are tissue-specific tend to also say, OK, let me help you become a heart. Let me help you become a liver. And indeed, that turns out to be the case. If you just take hearts, Comparing an adult mouse heart to an embryonic mouse heart to, in this case, a, 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 a sham-operated adult heart to a pressure-overloaded adult heart, uh, hearts in which we have induced pressure overload by a surgical coarctation of the aorta. The big differences are between the embryo and everything else. And so here's the embryos over here, the other guys over here. This is the link expression profile. And here's normal hearts, here's your uh, pressure overloaded hearts, here's your sham operated hearts are kind of mixed up over here. So link RNAs look to me like they're going to be not so much stress mediators, stress regulated factors, which is what micro RNAs are, but that they're going to, um, to help define the intrinsic properties of the organ organism based on development. So let me close the circle now by solving one of the puzzles, uh, solving, helping you understand the solution to one of the puzzles in cardiac genomics. And that was the puzzle of the SNPs that are located in a particular region of chromosome 9, the P21 region. 
In 2007, four papers came out, two in science, one in nature, and one in the New England Journal, that described, independently described a SNP here, that SNP, as a risk group is for either coronary artery disease or myocardial infarction. And I mean, there's never been such val cross validation in, in genomics, to my knowledge, uh, in cardiogenomics ever since. The bad news was there was not a protein coding gene anywhere near this SNP. And so here's the entire region of the chromosome. Here's your SNP. There's a lot of other SNPs that are also uh, uh, associated. Here's the, the log score of the, uh, um, uh, um, I'm sorry, associated with uh, MI. There's some association with type 2 diabetes, but here's where the protein coding genes are. And they've got two uh, tumor suppressor genes over here and a regulatory gene over here. This is a very, very far away. It's hard to understand how this SNP might be affecting anything that encodes a protein. And in fact, it's not. What we learned is that this SNP is in a long non-coding RNA called animal. And it is smack dab in the middle of part of the coding part of the animal, as are many of these other SNPs that are similarly associated with coronary artery disease and MI. But in 2007, uh, 2008 and 2009, when this long non-coding RNA was identified, nobody really had an appreciation for what long non-coding RNAs would do. So these data have been out there for a while. Now we know. Anrol, which is antisense non-coding RNA in the Inc4 locus, is a mediator of multiple aspects of human disease. It has to do with stat function, which is transcriptional regulation and inflammation. It does, in fact, regulate the function through this antisense tethering mechanism that I described, the antisense non-coding RNA, of, of some of these upstream genes that are expressed. It has a variety of other effects on chromatin structure and, and, um, trend, and gene transcription. So so this is a long non-coding RNA that was discovered using GWAS analysis, the most successful GWAS study ever done in, uh, in heart disease. And now I think we're beginning to understand its function because of the Human Genome Project and ENCODE. So let me summarize what I've tried to tell you today. Um, there are variants in protein coding genes. They're very important. Common polymorphisms have minor disease effects, large population effects. Um, many times we will learn from them uh, things we have not known about the disease. So perhaps we can use them to identify unknown mediators of the disease. Uh, and in, as in the case of the, the clinka polymorphism that we described in the renal chloride And potentially there is the development of novel diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. I, I think that we may have reached the apex of what we're going to do with common polymorphisms. Rare mutations have major disease effects. But each individual polymorphism obviously has a small effect on, on the population. There is, however, a large cumulative impact because we all carry them. And that calls for individualized management, and I've tried to show you how it is that we may move towards that direction. Non-coding RNAs, I, I believe we're going to see an explosion of information of this in the future. There's already been a tremendous amount of work on microRNAs that have small individual effects, large aggregate effects through the butterfly effect. They are readily targetable and clinical trials are underway in a variety of organ systems. And finally, the link RNAs that I've introduced to you, what the functions of this class are, are largely unknown. It seems to be very diverse. They have been able to explain some previously inexplicable to you associations. And certainly, the fact that we have these non-coding RNAs indicates that that empty part of our genome really is not junk. So I thank you very much. Uh, again, it's a special pleasure for me to be here. And if there's time, I'll, I'll answer your questions. Uh, uh, John, for that incredible sort of force of contemporary genetics. We, we do have time for uh, a couple of questions. Maybe I could ask you to comment on uh, two, two things one, from your talk. One is uh, whether microRNAs, uh, in point of fact, how much uh, promiscuity is there in terms of crosstalk uh, uh, among them? And a uh, not a related issue, but another question regarding them is uh, the drug delivery aspect of, uh, of them. Your, your yeah. So those are, those are great questions. MicroRNAs tend to, tend to occur in families. Um, and so this is as, as close a relationship between structure and function as you may be able to find in biology. This is 20 nucleotides whose job it is to bind 
in an, in an anti-sense manner, if you will, to 20 complementary nucleotides. So the, the closer the sequence matches, especially at the five prime end of these microRNAs, which is conventionally known as the seed sequence, it's about seven nucleotides for the five prime end. Um, the, the closer the, the match, the stronger the effect. Um, and so when you have, when you have families that, that diverge within the seed sequence, you get more divergence in function. How, how, do you, uh, how do you use these molecules as targets for therapies? Well, there's a variety of chemistries, and I refer you to some recent, uh, actually I think I had one on the, on the slide, recent uh, reviews by Ava van Roij, who's, who's leading kind of the field in the different chemistries, applying the different chemistries in the heart. But you can stabilize microRNA sequences that are antisense to the microRNAs and just inject them as naked sequences and they will insert themselves into the cells in which the microRNAs are being expressed and tie them up for weeks at a time. That's antagonism. Agonism or mimicry has been much more difficult uh, because it's hard to deliver a microRNA into a cell and there are various forms of liposuction or whatnot which, are, which have not been especially successful. Yeah, great. Other uh, questions? Um, Dr. Jane? Um, Gerald, that was really wonderful. I just had a, a question. You know, you made the case the last 5,000 years of human evolution and the inability to suppress um, mutations. Um, is that a, um, uh, I don't know, I, I was trying to figure out, is that a genetic event largely, or is it not just a genetic event, but also how we have impacted life on Earth, and do you see an increase in mutation rates in any other species during that period? Uh, no, you, you don't. Uh, so the, so the, the mutation rate is attributed, I'm, I'm not an evolutionary, uh, an evolutionary geneticist, the increased mutation prevalence, so the rate does not change, right? The rate is constant. The prevalence is basically due, one, to a population explosion. And then the difference between the African-derived populations and the European-derived populations is attributed to the bottleneck that occurred during the Out of Africa expansion 30,000 years ago. And so, but, but it really is just a numbers game. If you are doing fruit fly experiments that are, or yeast experiments or whatnot, and you expand the population, you will get an increased prevalence of rare mutations, even though they may only exist in, in one or a couple of individuals. But it really does take a lot of time to then backtrack and, and suppress these if, if they alter fitness. Yes, yeah, Brian. Dr. Carol, that was wonderful. It was odd. Here on the radio these days, you can, for 100, 200 bucks, get a personalized genome. Uh, if you say you uh, get a kit, I don't know, you take a swab, yeah. some blood, you can get that. Right. Are, are these uh, only protein coded? Do you happen to know? Are these protein coded? Are these uh, mirrors? Are these, these links? No, so, so no. what should I do? Should I wait another year or so? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean. No, but, and, and your, your comments about uh, the reluctance for people to yeah. run all these genetic screens and, and uh, echocardiograms doesn't speak highly for the company developing these. So, so, a couple of things. One is, yes, that when you get a, a whole quote genome, you're getting an exome. An exome, I think, costs about $500 now. Um, and then some of the fly-by-night companies, though, they're doing just little targeted, so they're doing exome pull-down, and then they're doing targeted things for particular DNAs. One of the problems that we have had, in, in, uh, and, and this is relatively recent, is you know people watch CSI, and they don't want to have their DNA on record. And, and that's just a fact. It's like, there, nothing will tie you to a crime like, you know, Dorn who, like, I did it. And, and when you, there is, there is absolutely, when people will say, can you guarantee that my DNA or genetic information will never fall into the realm of the NSA? I, and I say, I absolutely cannot. I don't think it's going to be anymore. So, uh, you know, like maybe if you've got some nefarious scheme plan, you don't want to get your shit <laughs> <laughs> well, On that note, let me uh, thank Jeff Joe for a